Uh, Father, we thank you very much for the privilege we have once again to come before you. We know that any time we come before you is a solemn moment. When we can allow you to do extraordinary, miraculous things in our lives. You've called us for ministry. And a call for ministry is not child's play. It's for men and women who realize that the ministry carries a great responsibility. And Lord, we're praying that tonight, as we consider this important subject, you equip every one of us more for the ministry in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that your word be translated into active, dynamic power that will come within our soul, within our spirit, within our inner man, that though the outward man may be decaying and getting weak and old, the inner man will be stronger and stronger every day in Jesus' name. Prepare our hearts to receive. Help us to be in the right attitude. To be able to get the best from you tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And you know, I always want you to say a great amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We've been considering this important, wonderful series. And it's been the series on Elijah and Elisha. Already we dealt with the first message in the series. The minister, the man, Elijah. And then we dealt with the second one. The ministry and the mission of Elijah. And then with the third one. The message and the miracles through Elijah. Now we come to the final in the series at this time. The mantle of Elijah. Everybody say that. The mantle of Elijah. And I welcome you here tonight, believing that the Lord is going to do wonders. And the Lord is going to pour His Spirit upon you in a great measure, in a measure you have never known, in a measure you have never seen. And this power, this authority, this mantle we're talking about, the mantle of Elijah, better still, the very mantle of the Lord Jesus Christ, in all its power, in all its anointing, in all its unction, in all its miracle working gifts, will come upon your life in Jesus' name. As we look at this mantle of Elijah, I want you to notice something. Because you see, sometimes when you read the scriptures, you may not exactly notice what the Lord is doing, and how the Lord has prepared his people, and how the Lord from the very beginning had prepared Elisha, and had been getting him ready from the very beginning for this mantle of Elijah to come upon him. I'm reading from 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm reading there from verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, saying to Elijah, Go, Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Azael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel Meholah. Shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room? I need, you need to study scripture. Even though we say this is revival session, revival message, revival hour, the light must come with the heat. The heat must go along with the light. Look at all these bulbs around you here. They give us light. They also give heat. And many people do not understand the combination. They feel that at the revival time, all we do is just jumping, singing, shouting, claiming, uh, you know, signing on authority. 
there is light as well as heat. And as you read this passage here, God was talking to Elisha, sorry, to Elijah. And then he said, Elijah, you know what you're going to do? You are going to anoint Azael to be king over Syria. That's not part of Israel. Your ministry, the influence of your ministry, the impact of your ministry will go beyond Israel and get to Syria. And even the leadership of Syria, of the strange land, of the enemy land, you are going to have impact on the leadership, the choice, the anointing of the leadership over there. And then also he said, Jehu, will you also anoint to be king over Israel? And then he says, Elisha, will you anoint to be the prophet in Israel? That's one thing you need to understand. Another thing. Do you know that actually, as you read the account, Elijah did not exactly, directly anoint Azael and Jehu? Do you know, as you read the scriptures, that actually it was Elisha that eventually anointed Azael and proclaimed to him that he will be the king of Syria. Do you know it was Elisha that actually anointed Jehu to be king? And he sent a servant while they were waiting. And he said, when you get there, pour the oil on him. And tell him, the Lord has anointed him to be captain over his people, Israel. There's something here now. Elijah, this is your work. But you will not do it directly. The one you are going to choose as a prophet after you is actually the one that will carry it out directly. But when he carries it out, it's an expansion. It's an extension of your ministry. You are the one still doing it. Although he went up, he was still ministering through Elisha. Now, listen to this. The Lord used the word anoint. And he said in this verse I've read to you, in verse 16, and he said, and Elisha, the son of Shepherd, of Abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Uh, do you know that everybody, every time we mention anoint, anointing, people are looking for bottles of oil. Do you see that Never do we have a record that Elijah anointed Elisha with oil. Do you see, when you read the word, and when you say we want anointing, they're not using oil in that place. And because they're not using anointing oil there, there is something, there is something, there is something missing. Nothing missing. Every time we mention anointing, we're not going to show the market to go and buy a bottle of olive oil. Every time we mention anointing, we're not going to a bakaliki to go and buy palm oil. Anointing doesn't always mean that the literal oil is made use of. You can see this. How many people don't understand? And that's, it's because they have the heat without the light. Other people have the light without the heat. But it's a combination. It's a combination of the light and the heat together. The heat and the light together. Now, look at this now. And in verse 17, And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Azael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha stay, slay. Do you realize once again? Because when you read prophecy, you need to understand. And from the Bible record, Elisha never carried a literal sword. 
Because you see, when you read that in the Bible, the one that escapes the sword of Azael, Jehu will slay. And the one that escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, will slay. Then you begin to look. He is just talking about the ministry they will have. That God is going to walk through one, two, three. Azael, Jehu, and Elisha. And as he's going to walk through them, if the whole thing, the one that escapes the first will be caught by the second. And the one that escapes the second will be caught by the third. That's all it's saying. And then it says over here now, in verse 18, Yet have I let me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, every mouth which have not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha. Think about that. Elisha was the last one to be mentioned. Azael first, Jehu second, Elisha third, in fact, he that escapes the sword of Azael, Jehu will slay. He that escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will slay. And if you don't understand the plan and the program of God, you're not going to be looking for Elisha first. And that's the reason why we're telling our people here, study the word, study the word, study the word. When you just have a cursory look over the word and you run over the pages of scripture, a lot of these things you don't get and you don't understand. And so he departed thence and he found Elisha. I pray the Lord will find you. I pray that your mentor, the one to develop you, to mentor you, the one to put the mantle upon you, the one to help you get into that dynamic ministry that the Lord is preparing you for, I pray he will find you. Uh, you know, uh, you, uh, so there are times that people, that God wants to raise up as Elisha in the ministry today, they will, they will, they will be running from the Elijah. I was just talking to one of our leaders at the beginning of, of this Congress, and I've spoken to him before, but I had to call his friend beside him. I said, look, you are separating from me. You're preaching good doctrine, you're preaching sound doctrine, you're doing well, your ministry is going on, but you're running away from me. And you see you're doing that. I told him in the presence of his friend, I said it's because some people, some years ago, are making fun of you. Pastor's boy, pastor's boy, pastor's boy. And he became ashamed and shy. And because they were pointing to him like that, he started withdrawing. I said, get near, get near. You need a mentor. You need a leader. So that all that God wants to do through you, the Lord will do it. You see, if you don't allow Elijah to find you, and you are withdrawing, and you are drawing back, why? How are you going to fulfill your ministry? And he departed thence, and he found Elisha, the son of Shephard, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he was the twelve, and Elijah passed by and cast what? What? Tell me out loud, his mantle upon him from the very beginning. The transfer of the power was symbolically demonstrated by the passing on and the casting on of the mantle upon Elisha. Eli for Elisha, the mantle of Elijah was very symbolic of the calling 
of God for him into the ministry and of the power of the Holy Ghost upon him for ministry. When they first met, you can see it here, the call of Elisha was communicated by casting Elijah's mantle on him. At the time of Elijah's departure, spiritual power, that double portion of the spirit, was also symbolically communicated through Elijah's mantle. At the beginning, Elijah's mantle. At the end, Elijah's mantle. Look at it. In Second Kings, Second Kings, chapter two, reading from verse. 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and thought, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and all seas of fire, and departed and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a wild wind into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and wrenched them into pieces. And he took up also, what? What? The mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also, at meeting the waters, they departed hither and thither, and Elisha went over, you will go over. Tonight is your night. You will go over in Jesus' name. When the sons of the prophets which were to view what Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed themselves on the ground before him. You have seen it very clearly then, that at the beginning, the call was communicated to him in a symbolic way casting the mantle on him. And then at the departure at the end, the transfer of power, the granting of his request, the double portion of the spirit was also communicated in a symbolic way through that mantle. Notice something, please, please, very important now, carefully, that Elisha did not use that literal mantle of Elijah. Every time there was a need to perform a miracle. Elisha did not keep that mantle as a charm, as a piece of idol. To use it every time a miracle was needed, except this initial parting of John. Why? Oh, because that was the only thing that Elijah used the mantle for. When he raised the dead, he didn't use the mantle. When he multiplied the meal, he didn't use the mantle. When he multiplied the oil, he didn't use the mantle. When he wanted rain to come, after three and a half years of drought and farming, he didn't use the mantle. The only time he used the mantle to have a miracle, a supernatural exploit wonder, was when he was going to cross Jordan. And so Elisha, when he wanted to cross Jordan back, the only time his master used the mantle was that, crossing Jordan. And the only time he used the mantle, literally, was the crossing of Jordan coming back. He didn't make it a piece of idol to turn to idolatry. He knew that it wasn't the literal mantle to be used as a charm. It was the transfer in a symbolic way of the power of the Holy Ghost upon Elisha. And don't you see, 
when the people, the sons of the prophets that were watching, when they saw him, was their testimony. Their testimony was not on the mantle, the literal clothes. Their testimony was, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And I pray, that spirit will rest upon you. I said that spirit will rest upon you. And we're going to look at three parts in the message. Number one, Elisha's call and preparation for ministry. Elisha's call and preparation for ministry. Number two, Elisha's consecration and perseverance with his mentor. With his mentor. Elisha's consecration and perseverance with his mentor. Number three, Elisha's confirmation of power for ministry. Elisha's confirmation of power for ministry. Come back to number one, Elisha's call and preparation for ministry. When the Lord calls us, and we know about that call, and we need to respond to that call. And then we need to spend some time in preparation for the call of God upon our lives. You come back to your first Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19, verses 15 and 16. And the Lord said unto him, saying unto Elijah, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, when thou comest, anoint Azael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, this is our man. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. That was a call coming from the Lord himself. Elijah was commanded by the Almighty God that he will anoint Elisha to be the prophet to take his place after he's gone. After he is gone. After he is gone. After he is gone. I cannot stress that too much. You see, there are people that sense the call of God upon their lives. And instead of staying in their place, at a time and period of preparation, and they want to do it like Absalom. And they are not willing to be patient, and they are not willing to persevere. And they want to take over immediately and do whatever it is, kick off the Elijah that is there. But Elisha, he received the call. And he knew that there was a time, there will be a time of preparation. His call was from the Lord. And the response of this Elisha to the call was very, very impressive. If you look at the verbs that are used for him, he ran after Elijah. He arose. He went after him. He ministered unto him. In First Kings chapter 19, reading there from verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shepherd who was plowing with twelve yokes of, of oxen before him. And he with the twelve, and Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. And he led the oxen, and he ran at Elijah. The morning shows the day. Your first response, your first attitude, when the call comes upon you, your first answer to the Lord, when he calls your name, tells a lot about you. The passion, the concern, the, the seal, the fire, the willingness, the readiness. At the first time the call comes upon you, 
shows a lot about you if you can keep it on. He ran at Elijah and he said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother. Uh, this is a family man. He loved his father, he loved his mother. And he said, when I was coming to the farm today, and I said, bye-bye. I didn't know that I'll be receiving the call. I didn't know either. And so, if I go from here, they'll be looking for me. They'll think maybe something has happened to me. Therefore, let me go back to them very quickly and just say bye-bye to them. Kiss my father, kiss my mother. And then, I will follow thee. Then, I will follow thee. I will follow thee. Response to the call. And he said unto him, go back again. For what have I done to thee? Go back. Test from the very beginning. And this is what some people will not be able to endure. If there is a mentor, if there is a leader, if there is a pastor, that the pastor may know their calling, he may know their skill, he may know their ability. He may know the plan of God for them in usefulness in the ministry. And actually, he is very much interested that they will fill the place that God has for them. But that mentor may test the willingness and the readiness and the understanding and the maturity and the passion of this individual and may say something that looks like is discouraging me. May say something, may do something that looks like I'm not needed. May do something, may say something I'm not wanted. And then they expect that the mentor will come and be begging them, appealing to them, convincing them. How can you say we don't love you? How can you say that we don't need you? How can you say there is no place for you? Oh, if we do that, you have to be begging the man and begging that woman every time he has, you know, trial or test or whatever. You have to be begging and begging. You have to spend a lot of your time just pleading and begging. But, you know, here is where many people fail. When the mentor, when the leader tries to test them and the test looks like discouragement. And then they listen to the devil. And then the devil says, they don't need you. They don't want you. Why don't you find your way? And they find their way into another place. But that's a place the Lord has not appointed. I pray you'll be able to stay. Whatever the test, you will stay where the, the Lord has appointed you in Jesus' name. In verse 21. And he returned back from him. And he took a yoke of oxen. And he slew them, and he boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And then he arose, and he went at Elijah, and he ministered unto him. He responded to the call. Not only that he responded to the call, he kept on following, kept on following, kept on following Elijah. And everybody knew, everybody knew. And, and Elijah was not afraid that he was a professional man. And he was successful in his field, agricultural field. And even though he was successful, as he received the call, he started following this unpopular, uncompromising prophet Elijah. That nobody said any, anything about anything good about him in the court, in the palace of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, this person that what they knew him for is turn prophet that will allow farming three and a half years in the land that's all they knew about him and yet Elisha followed this man because he knew he knew the call of God upon his life and he knew that this Elijah was the prophet the Lord has appointed to lead him to direct him to teach him to mentor him and then we're reading, it is the testimony of people concerning this Elisha in chapter 3 of Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 11. But Jehoshaphat 
said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shepherd, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. <laughs> you don't understand. This man, professional man, successful man, a man that had all the servants plowing with yokes of oxen. What do we call him today? Is that not a director? Is that not a manager? Is that not a proprietor? Is that not somebody having his own, having his own uh, employment, having his own work? Is this not an employer? Is this not somebody that we count in society? The call came upon him. And when the call came on his life, he responded to that call. And then as he responded to the call, in his preparation for ministry, just to be followed, I will follow thee. That's the commitment he made. And then he ran after Elijah. And he kept on following Elijah. And all that Elijah had for him to do, Elijah never gave him a seminar to handle. Didn't give him a message to preach. Didn't send him to go and walk a miracle. Elijah did everything. And then after Elijah had walked and walked, and he wanted to wash, Elijah wanted to wash his hand, Elisha will take a bowl of water and pour it in the hand of Elijah just to wash his hand. Be thinking now, be thinking now. Uh, if you are Elisha, is this what I'm going to do for my life? Is this the reason I left my yoke of oxen? It's just pouring water on this man's Hands, yes. Association leads to impartation. Association, just by walking with the man, looking at the man, seeing the man, associating with the man, and, and just looking at his life, and listening to his word, and listening to his ministry, and observing his action. Association eventually will lead to impartation. And if you are looking for the impartation immediately, and you are not willing to go through the association, just pouring water on his hand, just following after him, and just observing him, and just taking it in, taking it in, taking it in, taking in the word of God, and seeing everything that is going on, if you are murmuring inside the heart, I don't know how long we're going to continue this. And this man is, you know, is not getting weaker, he's getting stronger, and I don't know whether he's going to die in time. And I'm here, and all I'm doing is pouring water on Elijah's hand. You don't, and Elijah, I think, you know, we need to learn from this Elijah. Elijah didn't tell him a word. You, you know how we do, you know how we are. When we are very familiar with people, you know what we do when we love somebody? You know what we do when somebody manifests humility and dedication and perseverance? You know what we do? We call them, we say, please, 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 do you know the Lord told me, before I came to you that day, when you were on the field, actually before I came, the Lord told me that you are the one that will take my place. Therefore, be very observant, be taking notes, and write everything, because you know, this is a plan, this is a plan, you are the one going to take my place. Elijah never, never mentioned anything. If anything, it was even discouraging him. If anything, it was even telling him, go back again. What have I done to thee? Because you see, when you tell somebody like that, and sometimes it gets into their head, and even telling them eventually can disqualify them, because pride can come in, because a lot of manipulation, maneuvering can come in. Elijah never told the man. And the man never knew what is going to be the very result and the outcome of this, my humility and perseverance and obedience and, and faithfulness and, and dedication just following after this man. 
You see, that's the thing you need to learn. When we talk about Elisha, 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 and the mantle of Elijah, eh, there are many things that came before the casting of the mantle and the giving of the double portion of the Spirit of God. There are many things that came before that time. Elisha's call came while he was profitably employed, profitably engaged in a lucrative, successful profession. He was a master in his field of profession. He left prosperity. He left position to become a follower of Elijah and then to prepare for ministry. Come to point number two. Elijah's consecration and perseverance with his mentor. Elisha's consecration and perseverance with his mentor. Elisha consecrated himself in response to God's call. And he took the servant's place. It was so evident that others Whenever they refer to Elijah in relationship to Elisha, they called him his master. It was evident. The way Elijah comported, conducted himself, behaved himself, he, he didn't hide the fact that this is my mentor. And he didn't choose the word mentor. Look at this, look at this. In 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Verse 3, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take thy master from thy head today? That's how they refer to Elijah when they were talking to Elisha in verse 5. And the sons of the prophets, this is another place now, that were Jericho. They came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And then in verse 16, And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. After I was taken away, these people they didn't really fully believe. They said, maybe it's dropped on a particular mountain. Let's go and seek for him. But they called him, thy master. And I about Elisha himself, when he referred to Elijah. And I'm telling you, I've told you before, and you know, it's, it's something that I need to tell you again. I told you the glory and the beauty, the wonder of Elisha. Staying with Elijah so long and knowing quite a lot when you stay near a man, you will know his, you know, idiosyncrasies, you will know his non word communication techniques. You know, when we communicate, we don't just communicate with words, with vocabulary, we communicate with body language too. And, and different preachers and different mentors and different leaders, different masters, uh, they, have, uh, they have some peculiar, peculiar, peculiar things that they do, that they say. And, and you will know some, some things about them. And it's peculiar to them. And everybody has that. And when Elisha got very near Elijah, and he was with him every day, he knew. He knew the non Word, symbolic things, body language, and non word, not verbalized, everything he knew. And yet, and yet, and yet, with all that he knew about Elijah, he kept that mentor disciple relationship, master follower relationship, teacher student relationship, father child relationship. Uh, this man was fully prepared, well prepared for the ministry. Uh, look at this. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, see the way he referred to Elijah. In verse 12, Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, 
my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and wrenched them in two pieces. He called it my father, my father. Uh, can, can, you be, can you be close to a mentor, to a leader? And after being close to him quite a long time, yet still retain that mental discipleship, mental disciple relationship, father-child relationship, teacher-student relationship. Then uh, come back to this, uh, see this consecration. Come back to First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19, verses 20 and 21. And he left the oxen, and he ran after Elijah, and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, and he took a yoke of oxen, and he slew them, and he boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and he gave unto the people, and he did it. That was a public announcement. I'm done with this. I quit this. I'm finished with this. I burn it off. Nothing will disturb me. The burning of the instruments of the oxen was a sign of his consecration, a sign of giving up the old employment, of forsaking all to labor for God's kingdom. His consecration was tested from the very beginning until the very end of his training. His consecration was tested all the way through. Number one, the test of his affection. You will see how much he loved his father, how much he loved his mother. And he had to say, let me go on, not just say bye-bye to my father, kiss my father and kiss my mother. It is an attachment between us. They love me and I love them. And even though I'm self-employed now and I'm walking with the yoke of oxen, you can't tell the affection between me and my parents. And when I go to tell them bye-bye, I'm going to kiss my father and kiss my mother. And that was a great test in his life that he could still separate from those who he cherished because of his dedication to the call of the Lord. And then as you come to Second Kings, you see other tests in his life. In Second Kings chapter 2, Second Kings chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 1. And it came to pass... When the Lord will take up Elijah into heaven by a wild wind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And then it says, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came, uh, to, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah, he acted as if he didn't know that those people were talking to him to discourage him. Discouragement came from those other people asking him that other kind of question. And you know, there are some people that they have real, real, real attachment. And they knew the separation between Elijah and Elisha was going to bring a measure of loneliness in the life of Elisha. And they kept on telling him, they kept on telling him, do you know you are going to be alone? All these years we were telling you, you didn't have any friend, you didn't have any acquaintance, you didn't have anybody, you got attached to this man. And now he's going to be taken away from you. How are you going to make new friends immediately? Do you know 
that the Lord will take away your master from your head today. He said, yes, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah, on the other hand, in verse 4, Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, stay here, wait here. I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. See, this Elijah, this is a real mentor. This is a real mentor. This man had discipline. He could keep information. He didn't tell this man that was going to be taken away. And other people told Elisha, but Elijah didn't confirm it. Elijah was, you know, just neutral, just, just looking at them. And he didn't even tell him, I am going. And when I go, this is what you'll do, this is what you'll do. Because you are the one to take my place. He wanted him to pray and find that out by himself. And then it says over here, tarry here. Because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord leaveth, and as I so leaveth, I will not leave thee. And so they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets, that what Jericho came to Elisha. And he said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And let me tell you something. The Lord wanted to prepare many, many people. And without Elijah telling them, these sons of the prophets, the Lord gave them revelation that Elijah is going. The mighty prophet is going. The one that is able to confront Ahab is going. The one that is able to com uh, confront Isaiah, he is going. The one that is the representative of God, the mentor of all the sons of the prophets, he is going. He gave them the information. And also Elisha knew, the Lord gave Elisha the information. What did all these people do with the information? On the talk? Information? Information is power. Knowledge is power. When God gives you information, it should lead you to seeking something. There must be a reason why God gave that information. They didn't do anything about it. But Elisha, although Elijah did not tell him, Eli Elisha must have been a prayerful man that God could communicate with him that this man is going, I'm going to take him away. He will not die. And Elijah never mentioned a word about it. And Elijah, in verse 6, Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord leaves, and as I so leaves, I will not leave thee. Elisha, why don't you even change your vocabulary? Why don't you even change your answer? Every time, as the Lord leaves, as I so leaves, I will not leave thee. Oh, he said, there's no change. That's the implication of the first statement of consecration. I will follow thee. That's what I said the first time Elijah met me. That's the thing I said the first time he cast the mantle on me. That's the thing I said the first time he confronted me with this call. And that's why I kept on saying the same thing. It's the implication of the statement of consecration I made at the beginning. As the Lord leaves, and as I so leaves, I will not leave thee. And then it says in verse 7, And the fifty sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off observers, spectators. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and he wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over. That Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee. 
Isn't this man disciplined? This Elisha we're talking about. He wasn't flippant in talking to Elijah. He didn't ask, he didn't talk until Elijah said, talk, ask me. What I will do for you before I be taken away from thee. This is the first time on record that Elijah informed Elisha, it's true, I am going. It's true, I'm going to be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, that's what you are asking. Thou hast asked a hard thing. Testing this man. From the very beginning to the very end. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. If not, it shall not be so. Listen, this is the anointing that God told Elijah. Anoint Elisha. This is it. The double portion that he was to get. But he wanted to make sure that the desire was in the heart of Elijah himself. You can see all the tests that this Elisha went through. I told you, number one, the test of his affection. Separation from those that he cherished. Number two, the testing of his sincerity. Tarry here. No, I will not tarry. I committed myself to follow you. I'm following they go to another place, tarry here. No, I will not tarry. I made a commitment. I will follow you. I'm still going to follow you. Because if they had had a mind to return, they might have had a chance to return to the countries where they came from. That's what we are told in Hebrews 11 verse 15. And he had a chance to return. He had a chance to wait behind. But in the testing of his sincerity, he made it. Number three, the testing of his will. The testing of his resolution. The testing of his determination. When all those sons of the prophet said, do you know, I know, yes, I know that, hold your peace. I'm looking for something. Number four, the testing of his patience. The testing of his patience. It was a long journey from Gilgal to Jordan. His request was not even demanded until after Jordan. Number five, the testing of his faith. Ask what I shall do for you. He knew, he knew that Elijah could do something for him. He knew this Elijah had connection with heaven, with the Almighty. He knew this was the very representative of the almighty God. And he had faith. Do you have that kind of faith? Or are you so familiar with leadership? So familiar with leadership. That you don't understand. And if a test. A test of affection. The test of sincerity. The test of your will. Your resolution. Your determination. The test of your patience. The test of your faith. If a test comes then you are off. I pray you'll pass the test. He had the great virtue of perseverance. Consecration and perseverance in ministry cannot fail to receive appropriate rewards from the Lord. Point number three. Elisha's confirmation of power for ministry. In 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, reading from verse 13. Then we're told, eh, let me back up to verse 12. And Elisha saw it. Back to verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a one wind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. I pray you'll see it tonight. I said you'll see it tonight. He must have been a little bit tired and weak and weary. They've been walking. You see how long they walked? That's a long journey. 
And it was just in one single day. And yet he knew that my getting this power, my, my, my being filled or fitted for the ministry depends on this. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel. And the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and a symbol of weakness. The symbol of powerlessness. And a symbol of just native, personal, human power and strength that will not be able to carry out the ministry, the new ministry God was calling him to. He took hold of his own clothes and he tore them, wrenched them into two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And, and he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, he also, what's that, what does that mean? He also, that is, like Elijah did, like father, like son, like mentor, like disciple, like master, like follower, and, uh, uh, like the priest, like, you know, the people that is as he was following. And he could took the mantle now and did exactly what Elijah had done. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also at meeting the waters, departed hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And Elisha went over. I said, Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets that were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Bowed themselves to the ground before him. They accepted him automatically, immediately. This is our leader now. There's no voting. There's no campaign. There's no democratic selection. They knew by the coming of the power, the anointing, the spirit upon Elisha, they knew this is now the leader of the sons of the prophets. And they all came and they bowed themselves to him. Now, do you know that immediately after this, there was the confirmation, confirmation of power for ministry. Because in this same chapter, they came to him and he said, the situation of this city is all right, but the water is so bad and it's deadly. And so the first miracle was performed. Come on to chapter 3. Again, when the kings were in the battle. And he said, what are we going to do? Because it's like we're going to be destroyed. And Joshua said, is there not a man of God here from whom we can demand the word of the Lord? And in chapter 3, miracle. When he came to chapter 4, look at it. In chapter 4 again, miracle. How about chapter 5? Isn't that the chapter of Naaman? Miracle. How about chapter 6? Is that, is that not the place where the king of Syria sent and said, go and catch that man? And then the servant of Elisha said, my master, what shall we do? He said, don't worry. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And then again, miracles happen. In fact, when you look at those chapters, you'll see all the gifts of the Spirit. Apart from speaking in tongues and interpretation, which was reserved, which were reserved only for the New Testament, because the Spirit had not been given. <clears throat> because Jesus was not yet glorified. Only those two you will not find. All the other gifts of the Spirit, you'll find it on Elisha. I'm telling you that in chapter 2, from the time the mantle came upon him, miracles began. Chapter 3, miracle. Chapter 4, miracle. Chapter 5, miracle. Chapter 6, miracle. Do you remember chapter 7? I read it to you in the afternoon when he said, according to the word of the Lord, that uh, the, the food will be so, so cheap, uh, you know, by tomorrow. Miracle happened. Now, listen. We don't have time for me to go through with you and count and count all the miracles that were done by Elijah. And then count all the miracles that were done by Elisha. But listen to this now, listen to this now. 
when you count all the miracles that were done by Elijah. And then you count all the miracles that were done by Elisha before he died. You will find that the miracles done by Elisha, there are two times the miracles done by Elijah minus one. It remained one. And as you look at that, I think, you know, even Satan must have been saying double portion, double portion, double portion. But you multiply the miracles of Elijah by two, and then what you get is this number, and your own miracle remains one. Elisha died, and he was buried. And the bands were looking for a place to bury the bands of the Moabites then were coming. And as they were coming, the people wanted to bury, wanted to bury the dead. As they saw the bands of the Moabites coming, they dropped that dead man on the, in the grave of Elisha. What happened? The one miracle that remained. For all the miracles in the ministry of Elisha to be fulfilled, to become two times. The miracles of Elijah, that last one, was still fulfilled. I'm telling you that when God gives power, he gives power. And tonight, when God gives you power, he gives you power. And everybody confirmed. It was evident to everybody. The sons of the prophets, they said, the spirit of Elijah is upon him. In chapter 2, verse 9, the men of the city, they saw the spirit of Elijah is upon him. And then in chapter 3, verse 9, the kings of Israel and the king of Judah, they saw the power was upon him. The captain of the host of Syria, Naaman, he knew the power was upon him. A great host of Syria, they also knew that the power was upon him. The elders in Israel, chapter 6, verse 32, they knew the power was upon him. Even the bands of the Moabites chapter 13. They knew that the power was upon him. It was evident to all, evident to everyone that the power had come upon this man. When the power comes upon you tonight, it will be evident. I said it will be evident. There are many miracles that God wrought through this man. Let me just, let me just read one to you. In, in um, chapter 4, Chapter 4, reading there from verse 32. And, it, and when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. Gehazi was, you know, the servant of Elisha. Unfortunately, Gehazi did not have the faithfulness, the loyalty. The perseverance, the sincerity, the righteousness that Elisha had when he was following Elijah. You know, sometimes if you unlock it, you have you know, full followers. The work that ought to be done will not be done. The child had died and the mother had gone to Elisha. And I said, you know, see what has happened. And eventually, when he was coming before Anything, anything wrong with you? No, it's well. Anything wrong with the child? It is well. Anything wrong with your husband? It is well. Eventually, when he got there, he laid hold on his legs and, because he was full of sorrow. And then Elisha said, Take my rod and go to that child. Don't greet anybody, by the way. Lay it on that child and let that child get up. And the woman said, Gehazi, I'm not going to trust that man. And he held on to Elisha. And then Gehazi went there, did all that he wanted to do, and came back and said, no result. No result. If you are not faithful, how will you get result? Not loyal, how will you get result? If you are covetous, Gehazi, how will you get result? If you are going behind Gehazi to follow after Naaman, looking for money, how will you get results? But Elisha, in verse 32, chapter 4. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead. 
and laid upon his bed. And he went in therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and he lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. He wanted the child to be warm. This is a boy and he is a man. And then it says, he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and he walked in the house to and fro. And he went up and he stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and, he, and said, Call this Shunammite. And so he called her. And when she was come into her, he said, Take up thy son. And she went in and fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground. And took up her son and went out. This man got the power. You'll get the power tonight. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? And uh, you understand all that we've said about Elisha. It means you are going to be faithful. It means you are going to just abandon yourself in the hands of the Lord. You are not going to allow the tiredness of the body to hinder you to get the very best from the hands of the Lord. Why don't you rise up? Why don't you rise up? This man got so much power, so much power, that even after his death, when they were burying a dead man, and then they threw that man into the open grave of this Elisha, and the dead man touched the bone of Elisha, that man revived. This power, and the power is available tonight if you will call upon the name of the Lord, open your mouth and pray and call upon the name of the Lord. Are you saved? Sanctified? Loyal, faithful, committed, consecrated, expectant, full of faith, believing that you have a ministry and you have a call. If you have a call without consecration, how will you fulfill that call? Call without consecration, how will you fulfill that call? Call without commitment, how will you fulfill the call? Call without endurance, how will you fulfill the call? Call without perseverance, how will you fulfill the call? Consecration, commitment, perseverance, endurance, and willingness to follow. Call with humility, willingness to do all there is to be done so that the power of God will come upon you and you'll be well fully prepared for the ministry ahead. Are you willing to prepare yourself? The call and the preparation to fulfill that call. The call and the preparation to fulfill that call. Are you willing to pray? Until everybody around coming in contact with you well, no, the supernatural power of God symbolized by that mantle is upon your life already. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll walk, they'll not be weary. They'll run, they will not faint. 
wait on the Lord and it will strengthen your heart wait I say on the Lord tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high because ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea unto the uttermost part of the earth have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Or you have never even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost? How then were you baptized? Is it unto John's baptism? The promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Why don't you call upon the Lord and let him fill you, saturate you, empower you, energize you, envelope you like a blanket or the power of the Holy Ghost from on high. And I shall never yield to discouragement. The discouragement of the sons of the prophets. Even the apparent discouragement coming from Elijah. Tarry here. I'm pleading with you. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. The Lord has sent me to Jordan. I will not tarry here. I will not stay back here. I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you. As the Lord leaveth and as I so leaveth, I will not leave you. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. What man is there of you? If a son shall ask him bread, will he for bread give him a stone? If he ask him a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? And if he asks for an egg, will he for an egg give him a scorpion? If he then being evil, no. How to give good gifts to your children? How much more? How much more? How much more? Will your Father who is in heaven give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Double portion. A double portion. A double portion. A double portion of the power, the Spirit of God upon your life. My brother, my sister, it doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come in a hurry. It takes perseverance and patience and loyalty and faithfulness and prayerfulness and dedication to the word of God and consecration. That's what it takes. It doesn't come cheap. If you want to fulfill your ministry in this generation, there will be that passion in you. There will be that perseverance in you. There will be that desire in you. You want to be all that God wants you to be. Not child's play. Tell the Lord, do you have a ministry? And do you know you have a ministry? How are you preparing for the ministry? How are you preparing for the ministry? How are you preparing for that ministry? Five minutes prayer, that's enough? Ten minutes quiet time in the morning, that's enough? A passing look at the word of God, that's enough? How are you preparing for the ministry? You want to take over from Elijah? Don't you know what it will take? You want to have a ministry that will impart not only Israel, but Syria. Not only the common people, but 
every section of society. Ah, that's going to take preparation and perseverance on your side. There is no formula to it. It's a loyalty. There's no formula to it. It's a faithfulness. There is no formula for it. It's a yieldedness. There is no formula for it. It's a consecration. There is no formula for it. It's faith in God. There is no formula for it. It's forgetting yourself and forgetting your need and forgetting your tiredness and yielding to the Lord and surrendering to the Lord saying, Lord, I am a candidate. I want your power for the new ministry you have given unto me. There's no formula for it. It is following and following and following and following until the power will come upon your life. It's available for those who are willing. Available for those who are willing. Available for those who are willing. Elisha was willing. Persistent. 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 Test came from every direction. The test came from every direction. Persistent. And he passed the test. That's how to have the power. That's how to be fully prepared for the ministry. The test of his affection. Yes, he passed the test. The test of his sincerity. Yes, he passed the test. And the test of perseverance. Oh yes, he passed the test. And the test of his faith. Yes, he passed the test. That's the way to have the power. That's the way to have the power. There's no shortcut to it. Elisha was so wise, he didn't allow anyone or any group of people to discourage him. He moved on. He moved on, he moved on. He kept on, he kept on, he kept on until the power came. And he saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he wrenched it into two pieces. And then he took the mantle that came, that dropped from Elijah, and he took it off. And he got to Jordan and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And smote the waters, and the waters parted hither and thither. And the sons of the prophets that were watching, they came and they bowed before him. They said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. That's how it, it happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Lift up your hands as we pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we know that in these last days, when evil is running rampant everywhere, you need people like Elijah, like Elisha, like Peter, like Paul. Oh Lord, we give ourselves. We volunteer ourselves. Not only that we volunteer ourselves, we know you have called us. Your hand is upon our lives. Your calling is upon our lives. Lord, we surrender. Whatever it takes, whatever we need to do, Lord, not just by watch of mouth, in action, we're going to be loyal. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be committed. We're going to be consecrated. Whatever tests may come our way, we're going to overcome all those tests in Jesus' name. What we're asking tonight is that manifold measure of the power of the Spirit of God will fall upon all your sons and daughters so that we will do exploits in this time, in this generation, in Jesus' name. David served his own generation, is gone. Elijah served his own generation, is gone. Elisha served his own generation, is gone. 
Daniel served his own generation, it's gone. Peter served his own generation, and it's gone. Peter, Paul, that beloved apostle, the greatest of them all, he served his own generation, and it's gone. John, the beloved, he served his own generation, and it's gone. And when those great men in the, in the 20th century, when they died, there were people that wept like a baby. But they served their generation and they are gone. When we read of Smith Wigglesworth, but he's no more here. And when we read of John G. Lake, but he's no more here. When we read of Woodward Ether, and she, she's no more here. When we read of Mark Fassin, but she's no more here. When we read of all these people that served their own generation, and they turned many people to the Lord, and the power of the Holy Ghost manifested in their lives. And as we, uh, we, we think about Cole, Jack Cole, a. A. Allen and all those people, the people that had the power of the Holy Ghost in their generation, but they are no more here, they are gone. And now, here is our time. Are we going to disappoint this generation? This generation is looking for people, people that have the call of God, people that are consecrated to that call. People that are not children, they are not babes. People that are men with backbone, with conviction, with vision and mission. Oh Lord, we surrender ourselves. We give ourselves to you. We will serve our generation at this time in Jesus' name. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, give us the grace to be fitted. For the ministry of the 21st century at this time in Jesus' name. Pour your spirit upon your servants. Pour your spirit upon your handmaids. So that Lord, north and south, east and west, every country, every nation, every tribe, you will send us to every place and we will, by your grace, in your spirit, we will do what needs to be done in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that the prayer will not stop here. Seeking the Lord will not stop here. In the hostel, in the hall here, everywhere, we'll still be seeking the face of the Lord. And we'll seek you, seek your face, until that power, in a manifold measure, will come upon every life. And you'll turn us to become dynamites, effective ministers. When it comes to preaching, when it comes to healing, when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to counseling, when it comes to turning people to righteousness, that will make us fire brands in this generation. Do it for my brothers. Do it for my sisters. Confirm the word in their lives and confirm their word in the lives of those who hear them. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a bigger amen. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. Thank you, Jesus. All over the world, as the Spirit said it should be, all over the world, there is a mighty revelation, glory of the Lord. Everybody's singing. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it will be. The mighty 
revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sing it aloud all Oh, 